So I'm Pratap Subramaniam. I'm from VMware. Um, you guys are probably wondering what VMware has to do with persistent memory. Um, we are a software company. We think of ourselves mostly as an operating systems company, uh, where we build a layer of software that acts like an operating system for the infrastructure. Okay. So um, persistent memory for the first time um, provided a, a, a path where applications directly from CPL3 or at user space would want to manipulate the device. You know? And so uh, this is a very good opportunity for us to figure out how to uh, get applications on board on this device. So this has been a journey for a number of years. Um, and I just want to kind of take this as an opportunity to kind of share with you what we have done, what we have learned, and what we think is ahead for persistent memory. So um, VMware's view of persistent memory actually falls into three large buckets. Uh, in the first bucket, we just look at it as uh, yet more RAM, slower RAM, uh, just higher density RAM. Okay? And now somebody um, said that that's useless. I actually don't think it's useless. It's a beautiful way to get your applications on top of um, memory that's you know, prolific. Like, think about this. You know, uh, a large number of problems in computer science today are caused because you cannot fit the problem onto the hardware device. So what you do is you shard the problem. You split it into multiple pieces. And then you have this beautiful problem of keeping them all consistent. Okay? Uh, an entire space of distributed systems has been caused simply because we cannot have good scale up in your hardware devices. Now, if this is a way in which we can actually fit our problems into a single device much more easier, um, then why not? Right? So I actually believe a large number of people, customers, will actually consider adopting, say, the opt-in persistent memory DIMM or any of the other um, commercial products that come about uh, and just attempt to use it as RAM initially because it doesn't require any a particular operating system change or, or any other software change. So it's a beautiful on-ramp into accepting the technology. Um, and over time, I actually believe that application developers and architects will actually look at this and say, hey, if I can have a terabyte of RAM, then the previous um, you know, decade of solving distributed systems issues and maintaining consistency and coherency and eventual consistency and all of that complicated stuff goes out the window. My application becomes simpler. So they will actually attempt to evolve their applications in that direction. This, of course, has very little for us to do at VMware. We just realize that this is a possibility. So when we have a conversation with our customer, we'll say, you know what, just why don't you try the DIM, you know, um, as a, in, in memory mode and see, see how it floats. The second um, large way in which I think persistent memory will get adopted is it just as fast SSDs, okay? So uh, there, once again, the customer will not exploit the byte addressable property of, of these DIMMs, but they will use it in the blocked mode. So in their software stack, they'll look at it and say, well, I'm not gonna change the applications, but I'm willing to change the operating system. And, and that's where I'm gonna stop this time. I'm gonna buy this new device, I'm going to treat it as a, 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 a very fast block device. And then I'm going to run the, the, the appropriate driver in the operating system to make use, of, uh, make use of that. But I'm not going to really expose, expose the byte addressability of it. That's the next level of adoption, I think. You know? And the third and the most adventurous sort of uh, path is where you say, look, I'm going to get myself a new operating system. And I'm also going to up upgrade my, my application to directly, from the application, manipulate the persistent memory device using direct loads and stores, since the device allows you to do that. Okay? But it requires you to modify your application. So it is not something that a large number of app customers will jump into right away. Right? It's going to be many years of just playing with the device, getting familiar with it, getting confidence and trust and all of that stuff before they get there. Right? And you know, inside VMware, we focused on um, one thing that we do really well for every new device that comes about, which is to virtualize it. Okay, so we couldn't really predict which way the world would go 
So we said we will virtualize this device and we'll give you first class 100% support for persistent memory in an ESX virtual machine. Okay. So you could take any persistent memory program today that's either working in block mode or in byte addressable mode, and you can run it inside a virtual machine, and as long as there's persistent memory in the hardware, it will actually virtualize it for you and you, your program should work. So that was first things first for us. We just wanted to virtualize the persistent memory. And today, this, this, this is available. It's actually available in our product. Okay. And after that, we focused a large amount of our energy on um, onboarding applications in the byte addressable uh, mode. Okay, we wanted to take the long pole. We wanted to convince people that that was the right thing to do and so on. So we spent a large amount of energy on that one. And as we started talking um, to various people about that journey, about why would they want to use byte addressability, why not, and so on, you know, three questions keep, kept coming up constantly. One is that, you know, if you look at um, block mode, something that has been optimized for three decades, you know, um, operating systems, devices, and, you know, translation layers on top of devices and so on, have all sort of cooperatively figured out how to hide the latency of that I.O very nicely, you know. Doing better than that is actually quite difficult. Um, it's, it's, it's a path that has been optimized for 30 years almost, right? Uh, suddenly coming and saying that you're gonna do better than that is actually not, a, uh, not an easy thing to, 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 to do well. Um, and so there was a lot of skepticism, you know, when we would go talk to customers, they would say, well, really, is it really better? Well, let's think about this. You know, I would go and flush data to a device in big 4K chunks, but I wouldn't do it all the time. I would do it maybe once every uh, minute or so. Um, and, you know, my performance seems perfectly fine. Now you're telling me that you're going to flush your cache lines every time they get modified. Can you give me a sense for the memory bandwidth, uh, you know, explosion that's going to happen as a result of this? So there was a lot of questions about whether there's even performance to be gained in this model. So it's like you brought this device 100x closer, but now you're getting more chatty, right? And, and so it wasn't really a clean trade-off. It was not very obvious to us that by bringing this device 100 times closer, we've actually made things better, okay? Um, and then, um, when you do some things infrequently in block mode, you know, that piece of code can be segregated in your software. When you're writing a key value store or when you're writing some in-memory database, most of your code is about the in-memory database and every so often you might go off and try to flush what's in memory to the disk. The people who write that piece of code are not the core engineers in your team, okay? And, and they're off writing in maybe in one file out of 50 files in your source code, right? The, the, the path that actually writes to the, the disk. So, so it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, you know, when you're looking at your code base, you're looking at it as an in-memory database code. It's not, all this I.O. path is not hitting you in your head. Um, but with persistent memory, every time you update a hash link or a, or a linked list or something like that, you know you have to flush it out. So that piece of code is now front and center. So if you actually look at an in-memory database in this new world order, there will be plenty of persistent memory updates constantly all over the place, unless it's somehow you know, hidden cleanly for you, right? Now, this, the, there are many libraries that, that exist to hide some of these things, but uh, they're still kind of nascent in their, in their powers, right? And then comes crash consistency, you know, uh, which is another evil thing. Like, if you, if you have a linked list update that you need to make and you need to update two pointers uh, in a transactional manner and power goes off in the middle, you need to make sure that you know, either both the pointers have been uh, saved or neither have been saved, right? The problem is when you go to a piece of source code, 50, 60,000 lines of code that someone else has written and you now upgrade it to make, become persistent memory aware, if you miss one of those updates, um, figuring it out is, is a pretty difficult problem. 
you know, because you know you've got to crash the system several thousand times in various random fashions and figure out where what went wrong, why didn't you catch that one store of a pointer, and so on. So this is actual practical engineering issues with taking large volumes of application software and try to make them uh, use persistent memory. Right? So what we did was, um, since there was a lot of uh, doubt about whether all these things would work out in its favor, we started one at a time. We said, look, is the performance really there? Right? I mean, I couldn't stand here and convince you that, um, you know, sure, the performance is there. You brought this device closer, and, but the chattiness is OK. Don't worry about it. Even if you got three times more chatty, you'll still be fine. I'm not able to give you that feel. There's no gut in me that actually tells you that, right? Um, so we actually ran an experiment. What we did was we took a full-fledged key-value store, which is written in C, and it's open source. So we actually took that key value store and we modified it by hand to introduce transactions and to introduce logging of all persistent memory variables. And we put the entire key value store in memory. Okay? And we turned it into a byte addressable uh, piece of software. It was about 50,000 lines of C code. Um, and it took us about seven, eight months to do this. Um, and we wrote our own transaction library. Um, and we, so basically we modified the C code. It would make calls to this transaction library that we had developed. And all of this took us about six months to do, right? And thankfully, the performance was there. Okay, we, out of the gates, we got performance improvements. So the lower graph there you see is that same key value store running with absolutely no modification straight out of the master branch. And, uh, but it, it saves to SSDs. Okay, and the top curve is with our modifications in it, okay. where now it's pretending to be a byte addressable key value store talking to a persistent memory DIMM underneath and modifying this, this DIMM from user space. Okay. So this is, what, this is the kind of journey we expect our customers to go through or, or an application developer to go through in order to actually consume persistent memory from user space. Right. So, I was very happy the performance was there. We could actually do the analysis on this thing and, and figure out that, yes, the chattiness had gone up, but it hasn't gone up in, to such an extent that it overwhelms the benefits gained by actually the lower latency. Okay. But the whole experience was basically hard. Okay. Um, it, like I said, it's very difficult to debug a problem where you missed a, trans, missed a store instruction and you didn't put it into a transaction boundary. Okay. It's just an incredibly difficult problem to debug. Um, so identifying transactions is a, is, is a, is a key thing. Okay. And second thing is, um, you know, persistent memory, volatile memory is okay once in a while to leak. Uh, if you didn't free some chunk of volatile memory, it's like not the end of the world. But with persistent memory, it's actually bad to, to leave behind persistent memory on your heap. Um, and then logging, um, we actually introduced it manually. So we would actually say, when you say x equals 5, we will actually log the old value of x. And then we will change, the, change, change it to a new value and all of that stuff. All of that insertion is just very, very brutal. Um, we just didn't see ourselves standing in front of our customers and saying, oh, yeah, you have 100,000 lines of C code. You know, I think this is the direction you should go. You know, it's just not something we could do it honestly. Right? So, um, so what did we do? Right? Uh, we sat down and figured out what is, it that, what is it that's needed to have a successful conversation with our customers. And it just became abundantly clear that we just need to build the ability to manipulate persistent memory in a simple way right into the language. Okay. I mean, just like C allows you to do, uh, put stack variables and heap variables, have integer character and unsigned and all of that good stuff, maybe it should have persistent data types. Okay. Uh, maybe it should let you manage persistent memory directly from the program. So that's where we started. Okay. 
And then we had many conversations and we started playing with Golang because Golang is an open source piece of software. Everything is open source in Golang. It's a very vibrant community. Um, and you know, we started modifying that, modifying the Golang library. It became very clear to us that introducing a new persistent data type was the wrong thing to do. Um, you know, for instance, if you have a library that, that you have written and you have managed over the last 20 years that, say, takes two trees and, and blends it into a single balanced tree, it's taking two pointers as input. Now, you don't want to suddenly say, oh, well, that code doesn't work anymore because I have introduced a new pointer type called persistent pointer. And the old code doesn't know what to do with this persistent pointer, so it will just not even compile, right? That, that sort of stuff is just wrong. Uh, and the second thing is we noticed a few people going in the direction of taking a persistent pointer and turning it into a fat pointer, okay? Uh, it's not really a virtual address anymore. It, it's, 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 it's more than a virtual address. It has some metadata associated with it. And that, to us, was also not a wise idea. We wanted to go for an approach with this tremendous amount of code reuse, and a pointer is just a pointer, right? We wanted the comp compiler to generate the logs for us. So the one thing I was willing to do as a programmer was to say, here is my transaction start, here is my transaction end. Everything in the middle, any accesses to persistent memory, the compiler should generate the logs for me. Okay, I shouldn't have to do it. Okay. So we went with all these sorts of um, goals, and um, you know, we wanted to say long-running applications, short-running applications, if, if, if the persistent memory needs to be expanded over time, the language runtime should take care of it for us. You know, if, um, if we have to give up persistent memory because we're not using it, the language runtime should take care of it for us. Uh, and if the, gar if the language is a garbage collecting language, it should just garbage collect persistent memory also. So there was a lot of, uh, you, know, you know, we thought through this carefully and, you know, Golang basically fit the bill. Uh, because it does have a very, very nice, powerful uh, garbage collector already. And so um, we went ahead and started modifying Golang. We added all of the support for transactions, all the support for logging, uh, all the support for heap, ma heap management of persistent memory and the garbage collection of, the, of that memory and so on. And it was, um, you know, a, a, a reasonably enjoyable experience modifying the Golang compiler. And then in order to actually convince ourselves that we have built something that's useful, we actually ended up writing our own version of uh, Redis Key Value Store, but this time in Golang. Okay. And this new version of the Key Value Store that we wrote did practically the same things as the C, C version of the Redis Key Value Store that's out there in the wild, um, and, but we can compare it with our compiler this time. Okay. And all of these changes that I'm talking to you about, they're all open source, okay? So you could take this Golang compiler today that, that I've just described to you and use it for your Golang project, um, fork it, uh, you know, add value to it, whatever you want. And it's a full functional Golang compiler, okay? And, and when, when I say full functional Go compiler, I'm actually talking to various projects inside VMware uh, where they're actually um, starting new projects in Golang and telling them, hey, maybe they should start using this compiler. Okay, so it's, it's ready for business, right? So with this compiler, I'm, I'm gonna show you the same data that I showed you before. The top line, out of the gates, that's what we got with our Go, Go compiler. Okay, so this new version of Redis written in, written in Go um, is a lot easier to understand. When you look at this Go code, it actually looks like an in-memory database code. It's not the, none of the persistent memory things hit you in your face. So, you know, you could do your job well at this, at this, you know, using some compiler tool like this. So, where I'm going with all of this is that, you know, the device seems to have um, the performance. Uh, in, in my opinion, uh, once you start using byte addressability in your application, what you will suddenly start seeing is that there, is a, there was a piece of code in your, in your software that would do the periodic flushes to the SSD and so on. That whole chunk of code disappears, okay? There's no need for that chunk of code anymore. 
And that saves you many thousands of lines of code in your software. And then instead, you're now saving and, um, saving and flushing on practically every load and store, but then you are not actually doing it. The compiler is generating the code for it. So there is practically no code that's, that you have to manage to do this state management, in a sense. Okay? So it's a win-win-win all around the board. Okay? So highly encourage um, a compiler language support for this thing. Now, we tried Golang because Golang was open source. Uh, presumably, there'll be other people who look at C and uh, Java and Python and all of that uh, stuff. And I know there's efforts going on in that direction already. Um, we will work with the Golang community to make sure that what we have done gets uh, upstreamed as quickly as possible. I, we've already started talking to them, and there is some level of enthusiasm about it. Um, but you know, before that, I think we will have um, other VMware projects starting to use it and uh, you know, give us some feedback. So that, that's pretty much it. Uh, I wanted to share with you sort of a software journey, right? Um, any questions? So I, get, I have the first one. Um, I'm, I don't quite remember the answer, but I, but I want to ask it anyway. In uh, the last time I saw you do this uh, similar presentation as this, you mentioned the size of the team that actually you put on this. So how many people did you actually have on this? Yeah, well, so the one thing that is, um, uh, you know, this, this persistent memory journey has been going on for a while. Um, so my, my team actually had a complete 100% turnover before the first device showed up. Right? Um, so the first C Redis code was written by two people. Um, neither of them knew the C Redis code base. Uh, so you know, they made mistakes when they instrumented the code base. And they suffered through the debugging of it. Um, but it wasn't easy to debug it. Okay. And then, um, so they wrote the first transaction library, the logging library, and so on, those two people. Um, now I have a two other, uh, two new people. Both of these uh, guys have taken on the charge of you know, rewriting the compiler from scratch. Uh, neither of these guys are compiler guys. Um, so we introduced, they learned what SSA face was, and they introduced a new SSA face in the compiler and all of that stuff. So it's been fun. Um, we rewrote the transaction library a second time around because we realized that we were not doing many, many, many things right. Uh, now it's actually fairly optimal um, with the way in which it logs and keeps the, you know, decides when to use move NT and when to use CL flush and does the coalescing and a whole bunch of things. Yeah. I think we got time for one more. Yes, uh, this morning we heard in the PMEM presentation that typing was a good idea for uh, for programming persistent memory, um, and uh, you seem to think that that's not a good idea, but you want the compiler. Uh, to generate all the logging code. So how in the Golang extensions does the compiler know that it's referencing persistent memory without examining every reference at runtime? Okay, so let me give you a little, uh, little um, uh, few steps about how that happens. At the beginning of the program, um, we, have, we have a package called PMEM that we ask the Golang program to import. And then there's an API in that package where you can say, initialize me a certain amount of persistent memory. I kind of think I need 100 gigabytes of persistent memory, but I don't know for sure. You know, that's the kind of statement you would make. So you, it'll give you a certain amount of persistent memory from the system. And then you can add to it some named objects. And the beginning and end of that persistent memory region is a, a virtual address region into which no, no other object is going to show up. So if your pointer is between the beginning and end of that persistent memory region, then the compiler by default assumes its persistent memory pointer. Okay. So, right, right. So this doesn't come without cost, but the cost is all compiled away. So the, the, the comparisons of these pointer comparisons and so on and so forth. It actually goes through the compiler optimization phases. 
And you might find yourself optimizing many, many of those checks away because it's a, it's a check on constant boundaries. Right? No, it doesn't assume a static pointer. I mean, you just have to do a bounce check on the, on, on the persistent memory. No, no, you don't. Uh, I'm not saying that the check can be eliminated away. The check can be commoned away. If you have multiple such checks, you'll find that they are, you know, the, there's a lot of opportunity for you to coalesce the checks and then coalesce the, the code underneath it. You should see the kind of compiler optimization code that we generate for this thing. We spent some time thinking about the inefficiencies there. I mean, you can because the links are all there and, you're, and it's all open source. So yeah. it's, uh, uh, when I get to the next one, let's thank for top. I, that incredibly thoughtful presentation. Thank you.